Okay, while we're setting up the next talk, let me just remind you that if you're standing at the back and you I'd, I would actually like to sit down, there's, there are plenty of seats at the front and there's also seating upstairs and there are also microphones upstairs. So if you do go upstairs, you're not losing the opportunity to ask questions later. So make yourselves comfortable, settle in for the long haul. And my speaker has just disappeared. Where's he gone? <laughs> oh, I guess he's getting mic'd up. So we'll just have like a one minute break now. Please enjoy looking at our list of sponsors. <laughs> okay. You made me nervous there, you disappeared. Uh, yeah, I decided that uh, maybe it's not a good idea to give the talk anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'll introduce you very briefly. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Do you want to have it like that? I want to have it. Spin it around. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, folks, so we're ready now with the next uh, talk in this session. Uh, it's a contributed talk on um, Blackenbacker's attack. I guess you can't have a session on TLS without talking about Blackenbacker's attack at some point. And uh, it's one of the more interesting attack papers from the last year, and uh, the talk will be given by A.R. Ronan. Thank you, A.R. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. And so I, got, I want to talk about the nine lives of Blackenbacher's cat. This is a joint work together with uh, Robert Gilliam, Daniel Genkin, Adi Shamir, David Wong, and Yuval Yorom. Um, now, I don't really think that TLS needs an introduction um, for this crowd, so maybe I'll just skip it. So, you know, there is TLS, you just heard the talk about it, and I want to talk uh, today about a specific class of uh, cipher suites in TLS, which are the RSA key exchange cipher suites, and they all use um, a padding scheme called PKCS number one, version 1.5, which we're going to talk about today. And um, although we didn't see uh, any of those uh, cipher suites in the statistics that was j just shown, it was once the most popular TLS key exchange option available. Basically, 100% of all TLS connections um, used to use this option. Uh, however, it has a very, 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 very long history of practical implementation attacks. I don't have room to put all of the citations here. And uh, basically, it means that we had uh, multiple rounds of uh, uh, vulnerabilities discovered, patching the code, patching the standards, trying to make everything more secure. And in the end, we think that it was supposed to be uh, relatively okay. But moreover, um, this doesn't uh, even support forward secrecy. So basically, I think that we can all agree that today using RSA key change is not su such a good idea. However, um, at least still, when I checked, uh, last checked it in the end of 2018, it was still quite widely used. About 6% of uh, the internet connection still used RSA key exchange. And this is, although we have much, much better alternatives that are more uh, secure, probably more efficient, you can ask yourself, why is it so? And the reason, like in many other cases, is probably for backward compatibility. There's always going to be someone still using uh, Windows XP somewhere, and we don't want to lose any clients, so uh, the, we need to support it. And if I'm not mistaken, TLS 1.2 standard actually mandates that RSA key exchange has to be, uh, have to be supported. Okay. So what we did in our work, uh, we went over um, nine different uh, TLS implementations and tried to look at the security of the RSA key exchange option. And we found that seven out of those nine implementations were vulnerable to new type of cache-based uh, cache uh, padding oracle attacks that enable us to um, retrieve data on the plain text. And the, there were a multiple number of vulnerabilities in different layers of the uh, protocol implementation, and there was a lot of different um, um, oracles that we were able to find, and uh, this is nice and interesting work. But now, let's assume that you're going to believe me, and I'm going to say that I'm able to break 6% of the connections in the internet, and you might ask me, so what? I already mentioned that those connections are probably the ones that uh, arrive from uh, Windows XP machines, and they have much bigger issues than uh, TLS connections anyway. So why should we care? We are all very security aware. We update our clients and our servers. We use the latest versions. So we shouldn't be affected by this kind of attacks. So what I think is the main finding in the paper is that we show how we can use this uh, RSA key exchange vulnerability to actually implement a man-in-the-middle downgrade attack. And basically means that we can cause even modern, latest, up-to-date 
um, clients and server to still use this RSA key exchange option. And then to do it, we were, uh, to do it in real time, we had to uh, show a new way to parallelize this type of attacks. And in the result, we uh, claimed that we were able to break 100% of all connections to servers that use this vulnerable implementation. And the nice thing is that this also works even if the client doesn't even support RSA key exchange at all. So, even if, uh, so as a client, you have no way to protect yourself as long as the server uses a vulnerable implementation. So this is not so good. So to try to understand how this type of attack works, um, let's go to back to the basics. So this is RSA encryption. I'm sure that most of you have seen it before. We have an RSA modulus. We have a public exponent E that is used for encryption, private exponent D that is used for decryption, and we can encrypt uh, large numbers with it. But there's a question that how can we use this method to actually encrypt data? And there's actually some real world cryptography uh, problems in when we try to um, use this RSA encryption. And as a, an example, let's, uh, let's assume that we're going to use public exponent three, which was widely used in the past, and we want to encrypt the number 1000. And we're still going to use a um, 2048-bit RSA key, we want to be secure. And the one problem with that is that 1000 cube is a relatively small number. It's much smaller than the modulus. And actually, uh, calculating logarithmics over the real is something that's really easy, especially if you have a calculator. So if we want to be safe, we have to make sure that the number M that we try to encrypt is large enough. Another thing is let's assume that we want to encrypt some very small domain. For example, the answers to a yes, no question. So if we encrypt the same number, for example, here, zero or one, uh, over and over again, it's very easy to, um, to detect repetition. This, is called, uh, this uh, type of encryption is vulnerable to what we call dictionary attacks. And if we want to be secure, we need to make sure that the number that we encrypt each time is going to look random. So how do we solve this type of problems? Here we have PKCS number one, version 1.5, padding scheme to the rescue. And this basically um, uh, tries to solve the problem that I mentioned. Um, this is how it looks like in TLS 1.2 where we start with a two-byte encryption preamble, the byte zero and the byte two, and uh, this makes sure that the number is large enough. Then we have at least eight random non-zero bytes. This makes sure that we encrypt something that looks random each time. We have a zero delimiter that tells us when the plain text actually starts, when we try to decrypt. And uh, for TLS 1.2, well, we always have 48 uh, bytes of a pre secret with some specific structure. So this is how um, RSA encryption looks like for TLS. Now, a short while ago, about uh, 22 years, um, a cryptographer named Bleichenbacher um, showed his uh, novel Adaptive Chosen uh, Plain Text Attack. It basically exploits the fact that when we try to decrypt ciphertext, we, we validate that, uh, that the plain text, uh, depending of the plain text, is valid. And the way of this attack is relative, looks is relatively simple. We have our client encrypt some ciphertext and send it to the server. And then we have our malicious attacker. This malicious attacker records the ciphertext. And now what it tries to do is try to, to use the server as an oracle. And this oracle is going to answer the following question. For every ciphertext I provide to the oracle, does the decryption of the ciphertext start with the byte 0, 2, as it's supposed to do in the padding scheme, or not? And all of those different um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities that I've shown you uh, previously, the whole goal, uh, all, all goal is to use different side channels to um, give us this oracle, to turn a, a server to this type of oracle that uh, gives us the, this information. When we have this oracle, what we can do is we try to modify the ciphertext in a way that we're going to talk about later, and we're going to get the answer, does the decryption start with 0, 2, or not? And then we're going to adapt adaptively continue to modify the ciphertext, send more and more ciphertext, get more answers, more data, and in the end, we can use this information to try to actually decrypt the ciphertext and recover the plain text. So um, this is our Blackenbacher work, and now we want to attack uh, TLS. And when we try to attack things, uh, first, the, uh, we should start with defining the, our goals. And our goal in, when we attack in TLS, like probably uh, in most goals in life, is to try to get cookies. And uh, the cookies in TLS are um, keys that are stored in the browser that allows us to um, access uh, the server without re-inputting the password each time we try to connect. 
They are stored inside the browser and they are sent in the beginning of each TLS connection. Um, and that is the way that we, uh, the, the browser identifies itself uh, to, the, um, to the server. And the point is that if we are able to steal someone's cookies, we can just access the server and get all of the information out of the cloud. We don't actually need to break the connections uh, and try to uh, monitor all of, all of the communication. So the attack scenario for a key exchange is relatively simple. What we're going to do is we're going to try to sniff the TLS send check and the first um, message that is sent. We're going to use the Blachenbacher type of attack to decrypt the pre-mastered secret that is sent in the TLS send check. We're going to use it to decrypt the first message and we're going to get the cookie. And to be a little bit more concrete, let's assume that we have um, uh, some bank that have very secure web servers that is stored on some uh, cloud, uh, cloud provider. And we have Mr. Smiley here that wants to connect to uh, and check his uh, bank, bank account. He, he access the bank account, the cookie monster sniffs the traffic, and then he's, he's going to try to do the uh, Blackenbacher attack. As we mentioned, we need to try to measure some side channels or microarchitectural side, side channels in this, uh, in this case. So we also assume that we have our own malicious code that runs, uh, for example, on another VM, but on the same hardware as the uh, VM that uh, the bank uh, is using. And this, uh, this code is able to measure microarchitectural side channels, and using this information, uh, we can do the Blachenbacher attack and retrieve the cookies. Okay, so this is uh, relatively simple, but we are very greedy. As we mentioned before, we don't want to just get the 6% of connections, we want to get all of the cookies. And to do this, we um, exploit this uh, vulnerability for a downgrade attack. And the nice thing is that it only uh, requires the server to support RSA key exchange. It works also on TLS 1.3, on the latest uh, version, and uh, it does require an active man in the middle attack. And the question is, so can we get the cookies? And one caveat that we have is that if we want to do a man in the middle downgrade attack, we need to finish this attack in under 30 seconds because uh, otherwise the TLS send check is going to time out and no cookies are going to be sent over there. And the problem is that we need a very large number of queries and we only have time for about 600 queries before everything times out. So we don't get the cookies. So as a first iteration, um, let's try to look at the Firefox browser. And the Firefox browser, at least, um, I think it was uh, fixed by now, it had a very interesting property that we can prevent it from, be, from timeout using something called TLS warning alerts. This is something that has been known for uh, several years uh, before, and this allows us to do this uh, man in the middle downgrade attack. Basically means we can keep the session alive during the time that it takes us to do the padding attack, and we're going to finish the, after we finish the pending attack, we're going to finish the TLS and check with the decrypted master uh, secret key that we have, and we can uh, get, probably get a cookie. But there is still one problem, and the problem is that the user might notice that it takes several minutes for a web page to render, and we're going to see that something fishy is going on. So we want to be able to do it um, covertly. So here we're going to use also a very known and old attack called the beast, uh, beast like attack, basically means that we're going to use the fact that we can run JavaScript code inside uh, the user's browser, and this JavaScript code can repeatedly reopen co TLS connection to any web server that he wants, and in those TLS uh, connections, the same cookie is going to be sent to the server. And this can be done without the knowledge of the users, and it doesn't notice any kind of delay. And again, the session cookie is sent, and the nice thing is that we need just to break one, one connection, and then, and that's enough, we're going to get the cookies. Okay, so how this scenario, uh, more complex scenario looks like, we still have our uh, bank, uh, our bank uh, server, and we have Mr. Co uh, Mr. Smiley here, now he uses Firefox. And now he's going to access his web account, he sees he doesn't have any money. And he's very, in, in his despair, he's going to try to look for um, interesting deals on the internet. For example, try to go to winbigprizes.com, and as we know, all of these sites are scams, and we have uh, malicious people behind it. In this case, we have the Cookie Monster. So the Cookie Monster is going to um, provide uh, Mr. Smiley here with some JavaScript that's going to try to reopen uh, connections to the bank account, and it's going to do a man in the middle attack, uses the same side channels that we mentioned before, and in the end, is going to get the cookies. Okay, so um, this is very nice. But uh, we actually, I personally really like Firefox. This is the browser I want. Uh, That's the browser I use in, 
uh, myself, so I want to try to take the other bars also. also. So to do it, we're going to try to do, uh, to parallelize the downgrade attack. And the problem again is that most browsers will time out after 30 seconds. And we still can use the, the interesting fact that many companies have uh, multiple servers around the world, and they usually reuse the same certificate over those multiple servers. So they reuse the same uh, keys, the same RSA uh, public and private keys, and this is even true for companies that are certificate authorities by themselves and can just simply generate more keys, but this is something that's uh, commonly done. And now we can actually parallelize the attack across those multiple servers. Each server is going to be a separate oracle, and there's been quite a lot of previous work to how to try to parallelize this type of uh, pending oracle attacks. So can we get a cookie? And the problem here is that no matter how we try to parallelize that attack, this is an adaptive chosen uh, cipher text attack. And when we look at this, um, if we want to break 2048-bit RSA key, we still need at least 2048 uh, sequential adaptive queries. There's no way to go around it. And we, st we only have time for 600. So we need to find something, uh, something better to do. So to do it, we're going to uh, try to give a little bit more background. Uh, we're going to look at a, maybe a simpler variant of this attack called a Munger attack. And in this Munger attack, we assume that we have this following oracle. If we give it a ciphertext, it's going to try to decrypt it, and then it will check if the first byte is zero. If so, it will return one. Otherwise, it will return zero. And now, we're going to try to um, exploit the fact that RSA is a malleable encryption. What does it mean? It means that if we, if we take any number S that we choose, we're going to raise it to the public exponent E, and we're going to not see the laser pointer, but not right. okay. This is the S times to the to public exponent E. We're going to uh, multiply it by the ciphertext. When we decrypt it, it's going to get decrypted to uh, the original plain text M times the number S that we chose. And now we can uh, uh, start the attack with what we call a blinding phase, which basically means we're going to generate random S values. We're going to raise them to the public exponent E, multiply by the ciphertext, and then send them to our oracle. And if the oracle returns one, it means that this M times S is a relatively small number. The top eight bits are zero. So if we have the whole um, search space, for example, for the all possible values of M times S, and now we know that the top, uh, the top values are not possible anymore. So we reduced our search space. And now what we do in this type of attacks, we're going to iteratively continue to reduce the size of the possible it interval. And in Munger attack, in the later stages, it's usually one bit or half, or half of the space in each query. So what we're going to, uh, to get is that after a certain number of queries, we know that M times S is inside some relatively small, uh, small interval, and we can write it as M times S minus the start of the interval is some relatively small number R. So we can continue the, the attack. We're going to reduce the, the search space. And if we're able to continue it for 2048-bit queries, we'll have, we'll have a search space of one, and we're able to decrypt. If not, we can, uh, for example, if we have 600 queries, we're going to still greatly reduce the search space. We go down from 2048 to about uh, 400, uh, 400 bits, which is much smaller, but still too large to have any meaningful information for us. So this is what we can get with our 600 queries. But now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, assume that we can run this attack in parallel over multiple servers. So we get multiple um, such um, equations, and now what we can, we can do is uh, actually we can see that this is relatively similar, similar to the well-known hidden number problem, which was mostly used for uh, breaking discrete log based cryptography. It basically means that we can uh, reduce this problem of finding uh, the plain text M to the closest vector problem in the lattice. And here we are talking about a very small lattice. It's very easy to embed it and solve it using the LLL algorithm. And what we've shown that we need about, uh, with simulation, that we need about five servers in order to decrypt 2048 bit RSA, uh, RSA key using the Munger Oracle. And then we can get the cookie. Okay, so one thing that's important to know about this, uh, about our cookie like this, that this is not an actually improvement of the attack, this is a, a trade off. The initial blinding phase that I'll talk about is actually the most expensive part of the attack if we look about uh, bits of information per queries. And the parallel attack actually requires more queries than the original one. 
So why do we actually do it? And the reason is that this is a trade-off between the total number of queries and the number of sequential queries, uh, queries that we actually need. And this allows us to do the, this attack in under 30 seconds using the parallelization. So if you try to look at it, we have a very similar to scenario to what we've seen before, but now we assume we have several uh, servers that we can attack in parallel. We have still Mr. Smiley here. We're going to take all of this information, put it inside the lattice, and in the end, we're going to get our cookies. Okay. So um, to summarize our result, uh, we show new novel te uh, uh, technique using microarchitectural ar architectural side channels to uh, recreate those type of oracles. Um, in seven out of the nine implementations that we've seen, we uh, provide the proof of concept for the attacks for both the uh, Munger and Blackenbacher type of uh, attacks. And we show how to, we can parallelize this, this attack using uh, the LLL -L 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 algorithm. We had a very, uh, very uh, long and, and not very pleasant uh, disclosure process. We had to get uh, several very large companies to try to play nicely with each other. And some of them didn't want to play nicely. And, but in the end, we uh, were able to get all of them to patch their codes, and most of them did it quite well. There's quite a lot of stories, but uh, if, if you're interested, I would be happy, to, more than happy to talk about it offline. And uh, we also provided many different recommendations to how we can try to mitigate this type of attacks in our paper. But in the bottom line is, we shouldn't use RSA key exchange. It failed us too many times. This is, uh, what we've seen is that it's not impossible to implement this uh, type of um, cryptography with outside channels, but it's very close to impossible. And we simply should use better cryptography. But if someone really, 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 really must use this, the most important suggestion that I have is please separate your certificates. Don't reuse certificates between uh, different servers, and even don't use, uh, cert uh, reuse certificates between different versions of the TLS protocol. For example, use uh, different RSA uh, certificates for TLS 1.3 and all of the previous versions. And with that, I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Greg? Hi. Uh, just for my clarification, the oracle is because, I mean, if the oracle is present, it's because it reports the error more quickly than it progresses with the computation, if the padding was right? No, this is a microarchitectural side channel. Uh, we have different uh, type of oracles, but uh, for example, uh, it will access different areas in memory depending if the validation is okay or not, or if the first byte is zero or not. This type of, uh, of variance in running. Right. That, that's very subtle. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? So you, you portrayed this as a man in the middle attack. Um, does, the, does the client need to offer an RSA based cipher suite in its initial client ha hello in um, order for the attack to work? No. Um, as it was previously shown, uh, we can uh, use the Blackenbacher type of attacks not only to decrypt ciphertext, but also to forge uh, signatures. And so if, uh, if uh, for example, the same certificate is reused between uh, TLS 1.2 I can try to use the uh, 1.2 uh, server as an oracle to try to forge a signature and then use it to attack the TLS 1.3 protocol. Any other questions? So your attack requires um, JavaScript in the browser, multiple servers, and an attacker to be co-located in each of those servers in a, yep. in a parallel virtual machine. Yep. Did you get any pushback from the vendors that you talked to about the um, realism of this attack scenario? Uh, I think that uh, at this point of time, people understand that um, we could say attacks only get better, and et cetera, et cetera. And we think that they were nicer than I expected. Well, most of them <laughs> don't have any good explanation. I think that this attack, uh, attack, mo attack model is really strong, but they were still enthusiastic enough to try to uh, fix everything. Okay, I will buy you a lemonade later, and you can tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's thank Eyal again for his talk. Thank you.
we'll get we will get set up for the third talk now. Okay. Um, okay, I think these guys are good to go. Actually, we're not quite. No, they're not quite good to go. <laughs> Sorry, is this plugged in or are using this one? Pro, pro tip to anybody thinking of presenting RWC, never do a double header presentation. It always leads to complexity. Sorry, that sounds like I'm setting them up for failure, doesn't it? Okay, great, so now we come to the third talk, and um, it's about TLS2, um, about a system called DECO, and the talk will be given jointly by Fan Shang and Ari Yuels. Thank you both. Thank you. I'm gonna to talk today about DECO, a tool for building decentralized Oracle systems. Uh, my name is Ari Jules, I'm gonna present jointly with Fan Zhang here, who led the project and is uh, incidentally on the academic job market if you're looking to hire strong security people. Uh, so as I said, I'm gonna talk about DECO. I'll begin by explaining what an oracle is and then motivate the need for DECO. Fan, then we'll talk about the construction of the system a bit. One of the key applications of DECO is to smart contracts. You've all heard of smart contracts, of course, and you've probably heard of them in connection with tokens. Smart contracts enable the creation and management of tokens which you can think of as a kind of application-specific cryptocurrency. And they were, of course, a key ingredient in the token mania of two years ago, when prices were rising to stratospheric heights. Here you see the market cap of one token, which I will not name. And it seemed that everyone got swept up in the mania, including celebrities like Paris Hilton, who was promoting a token, the heavyweight boxer Floyd Mayweather promoted a couple of tokens and renamed himself Floyd Crypto Mayweather. And of course, a litter of new celebrities was created. In 2018, more money went into tokens, into token sales, than venture capitalists put into early stage internet startups, just to give you some sense of the scale here. But of course, if you know anything about tokens, you know how all of this ended. Right? It didn't end well. And part of the reason for this, I would contend, is a limitation in smart contracts themselves. The problem with smart contracts, because of the fact that they run on top of consensus algorithms, is that they lack internet connections. This is to say that they can't get data about the real world directly. This isn't a big problem if all a smart contract is doing is managing tokens. It's essentially just doing some internal bookkeeping. But this means that smart contracts cases where they can't access real-world data, really can't do anything interesting. Tokens are, technically speaking, not terribly interesting. Let me give you an example of this. One popular application of smart contracts, one that's trotted out again and again, is to insurance. 
And in particular, people talk about the fact that flight insurance, in principle, can be implemented entirely with a smart contract. The idea is very simple. If you want to take out a policy, you communicate with the smart contract, you let it know you want to take out a policy, you send it some money, and you've got your policy. Then, if your flight is canceled or delayed, the smart contract pays out automatically. No headaches with an insurance company dragging its feet, refusing to pay, and so on and so forth. So this is all well and good, but the smart contract, of course, to realize this application, needs to know whether or not your flight was canceled or delayed. How is it going to do this? The solution to this problem of smart contracts not being able themselves to reach out to servers to get data about flight delays and so on and so forth, solution is what's essentially a type of middleware called an oracle. It's software that runs off-chain and whose job is to go fetch data from servers, trustworthy servers, data sources, and push them to smart contracts. Often what an oracle will do is respond to a query sent by a smart contract on-chain, and off-chain it will go fetch the data the smart contract is requesting. The concept behind an oracle is very simple, but realizing workable oracles involves solving two major problems. The first problem is a problem of integrity. I said the job of the oracle is to go get data to push to a smart contract. How do we know that the oracle didn't corrupt the data that it fetched? Or how do we know that it just didn't cook up the data on its own? The usual solution to this problem is, of course, decentralization, which is to say that a smart contract will communicate with multiple oracles simultaneously, for instance, three oracles, and get the same piece of data from all of these different oracles. It then looks at the majority result returned by the oracles, and then if one oracle happens to be corrupted, the smart contract is still going to receive correct data. Okay. The second challenge, though, is the harder one, and this is the one we focus on with DECO. This is the problem of dealing with private data. There are many types of private or personal data that users may want to relay to oracles to be sent to smart contracts. For example, a user may want to show that she's over 18, and therefore to engage in a legally binding contract. Or she may want to show that she has a certain amount of money and is therefore eligible to participate in a token sale. Or she may want to show that her flight was delayed. If, she, for instance, she's purchased a flight insurance policy. And it's important that the user show that her flight was delayed so that her flight information doesn't have to sit in the smart contract and therefore be visible to the whole world. Well, for all of these different types of data, there are trustworthy servers out there able to furnish them. For example, the fact that Alice is over 18 can be attested to by, say, the Social Security Administration. If Alice communicates with the SSA website, she can find her birth date and it will be, if she's communicating over TLS, it will be securely transmitted to her. She has that guarantee. But how does she demonstrate to an oracle that the birth date she saw was 1985 and therefore that she's over 18? Here we encounter a fundamental problem. The problem is that TLS doesn't sign data. I'm using symmetric key crypto at the record layer, so there's no way for Alice to prove to the oracle that she saw a particular birth date. She can only prove it to somebody who happens to be so shoulder surfing. There are a couple of different current approaches to address this problem. The first, a natural one, is to change TLS to sign data. Now, this is the approach proposed in a very nice paper from ETH Zurich on a system called TLSN. It works well, but the problem, of course, is that it requires adoption. And although there are movements afoot to get signing into TLS, it hasn't happened yet. The second possible approach is to use trusted hardware, trusted execution environments like Intel SGX. My group has put forth a platform called Town Crier that does exactly this. This works well, but there are a couple of problems with this approach, too. First, there's an extra trust assumption here. You have to trust the trusted hardware. In the wake of Spectre, Meltdown, Foreshadow, there are people who don't trust trusted hardware. A second problem is that trusted hardware is not always available 
in the sense that Intel historically has not allowed people to load arbitrary code into enclaves, although I understand that's changing. So with this, let me introduce the DECO protocol. DECO facilitates privacy-preserving proofs about TLS data fetched by users to oracles. And Fan will give you a more precise notion of what privacy-preserving means than I've given thus far. Uh, so enables this proof to oracles and thereby to smart contracts. It doesn't require trusted hardware. It doesn't have that limitation that Town Crier does. It requires no server-side modification. You can think of it as being transparent to HTTPS-enabled servers. And it works with modern TLS versions, 1.2 and 1.3. Bear some superficial resemblance, for instance, to TLS Notary and other such solutions. Those only work with TLS 1.1. With that, let me hand the podium over to the fan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, in the second part of the talk, uh, I will present how DECO protocol is constructed. Uh, so let's begin with the proper introduction to the players in the game. Uh, here we have three parties in the DECO protocol. We have a TLS server running unmodified TLS. We have a prover as well as a verifier. And for uh, blockchain applications, the verifier is also called an oracle. But I will use a verifier uh, throughout the rest of the talk. As Ari has explained, the primary purpose of DECO is to prove uh, provenance or origin of TLS uh, ciphertext. <clears throat> well, what does that mean? For example, suppose the server is a bank and the, the client and the prover, which is also the TLS client, had the following interaction with the server. So here the blue boxes denote TLS ciphertext. The prover's goal would be to convince the verifier that this particular ciphertext is indeed from the bank. And again here, this is a TL ciphertext which is, which is not signed by the server. And instead, it, it uses MAC to protect integrity, but since the prover knows the MAC key, she can forge arbitrary ciphertext. This is the challenge. And uh, once the origin or the provenance of the ciphertext is established, the prover can either choose to simply decrypt the ciphertext or prove um, statements about the plain text in zero knowledge uh, without revealing the content. For example, to prove that her balance is greater than a threshold without revealing the exact balance. The main idea uh, of DECO is to hide the MAC key from the prover until she commits to the ciphertext that uh, uh, she wish to, wishes to prove provenance about. Right? Um, this is achieved in that code uh, call, uh, using a protocol we call three-party handshake. Right? If you wonder how would the three people go ahead and uh, shake their hands, shake each other's hand, we do provide the little visual aid. So for now, I'm assuming CBCH Mac for, uh, for, for the moment, but I will talk about another popular cipher suite uh, uh, later. In a nutshell, at the end of a three-party handshake, uh, the client and the server will end up uh, having the same encryption key, K-Ink, just as, as Eurotl's handshake, but the Mac key will be secret shared between the prover and the verifier. All right, this is the main... Um, this is the main idea behind three-party handshake. And the three-party handshake is the first step of DECO. Here is the overview of the uh, protocol flow of DECO. Right. In the first phase, in a three-party handshake, shared keys are generated. Um, and in the second phase, the prover will go ahead and interact with the server as a URU TLS client, uh, query the server and receive a response. But note that at this point, this, the prover still uh, don't have the full MAC key to verify the integrity of the response. But that is fine because the prover will get a chance to do it later in the protocol. Then the protocol pro proceed to the third phase, proof generation. As the prover send over, send to the verifier the response uh, to commit to it and gets back the, the other piece of the MAC key. Right now the prover has the full MAC key, the prover can verify the integrity of the response, and then choose to either decrypt it or prove statements in zero knowledge uh, according to the specific requirement of the application. So this is the high-level flow of DECO protocol. 
So I will, in the rest of the talk, I will talk about each step uh, briefly. So first, let's take a closer look at how three-party handshake actually works. We know, we already know what to expect in the end, but how, how does that really work? The three-party handshake is based on the two-party standard TLS handshake, right, which has two steps, key exchange and the key derivation. So we'll talk about what they are in the next slide, um, but the challenge here is we need to shoehorn this third party in a way that is completely transparent to the server. You want to do this, um, we leverage the homomorphic properties of, uh, of key exchange in, for the first step, and we resort to uh, secure uh, two-party computation for the second step. The first step is, as I said, key exchange, where the client and the server um, establish a, a exchange or a session secret using protocols such as Diffie Hellman. And uh, there are other key exchange protocols available, but the elliptic curve based uh, uh, Diffie Hellman is the recommended uh, algorithm to use, uh, therefore, it's the focus of the paper. In a three party handshake, you can, you can think of the prover as well as the verifier being two clients with independent Diffie Hellman uh, public keys. But in order for this to remain transparent to the server, the prover combines the two public keys uh, into one and use that to finish the standard uh, uh, Diffie Hellman key exchange with the server. Then all three parties will compute their Diffie Hellman values just as before by raising the peer's public key to the, to the uh, power of their private key. But now you can uh, verify that. Um, the prover, as well as the verifier, will end up with the secret sharing of the session secret Z had by the server. Here, ZP times ZV uh, is Z, which is the session secret had by the server. And note that here, the, um, these values are points on the elliptic curve because, um, again, because we uh, focus on the recommended the elliptic curve version of the ECDSA, uh, sorry, ECDH. Well, now that the session secret is uh, derived in the desired form, the second step is to derive a bunch of key uh, by running this session secret through a PRF. Right. So remember, the server runs standard TLS, so that's what the server will do. We, we have no control over the server's behavior. Therefore, the prover and the, the verifier need to uh, do the same to, to get the same set of keys. However, they, they can't do it directly because they can't give each other their shares of D. Right. So naturally, a solution is to use uh, secure uh, two-party computation to compute on their private input. It seems like we just need to construct a circuit that takes in two numbers, add them up on an elliptic curve, and run the results through a PRF, and we are done. However, there, this simple approach uh, isn't quite sufficient because, because two PC protocols are usually optimized for either binary operations or arithmetic circuits. But here we have both type of uh, computations involved. The first step is indeed arithmetic, and the second step is HMAC-based PRF, which is, uh, which is a binary operation. So that means a direct uh, implementation of this in using generic 2PC will, not, will only be suboptimal because the, uh, because the, the optimized 2PC works better with a single type of circuit. Therefore, we need to um, apply several optimizations. Uh, the first way we need to, uh, we essentially move the uh, first step uh, outside of circuit by having a custom protocol, 2PC protocol, uh, based on additively homomorphic encryption. Then this means we can now work with a pure uh, binary circuit. So secondly, we hand optimize the, the, the binary circuit. We started with uh, uh, efficient SHA-2 circuit from previous work and uh, added functionalities to make a PRF out of it and uh, um, hand optimized it for, uh, to reduce the size. Uh, the outcome of all of this is a uh, handshake circuit with the end complexity of 70, uh, 70, 70 uh, k And concretely, the runtime of the handshake, um, handshake protocol, three-party handshake, is about 1.4 seconds uh, in a LAN setting and about 5.7 seconds in a WAN setting. 
right? Although this is not blazingly fast, but, but sufficient for our purpose, because we envision DECO being used uh, periodically in most of the natural applications of DECO. Right, so far, we've been talking about G uh, CBCH Mac, but DECO supports GCM as well. Uh, essentially, the handshake for GCM is, uh, is essentially the same as what you saw with a with number of um, differences. One of the important differences, um, since GCM, uh, ciphertext itself, by itself, is not a commitment, we need to add a key commitment to the, to the handshake process. And also, the GCM key uh, is shorter. There's only one key uh, for each direction. So the key derivation is, uh, is slightly different. But overall, these changes should have, uh, should have small to no in fact, impact on the performance of the handshake. And since GCM is used in both version uh, 1.2 and as well as the latest the TLS 1.3, by supporting it, DECO works with uh, more than TLS versions. Okay, let's zoom out and take another look at the big, big picture. We've been talking about the first step. How can we generate shared keys? And after that, the second step for most applications is just a URU TLS, client, TLS, uh, TLS session that so I will skip that and talk about the final phase. Well, the task here is, now that the provers can prove provenance about ciphertext, what this means is we can essentially treat the ciphertext coming from the server as a commitment. Now the prover has multiple uh, options as to what to do to, uh, with that commitment, right? The simplest thing to do is to just decrypt the whole thing to open the commitment uh, entirely. Well, although this completely forego privacy in the, in the uh, response, but this still proves provenance. So it still, be, uh, it still would be useful for some application. Or the prover could, as I said, prove statement about plain text in zero knowledge. Well, of course, a general, generic zero knowledge proof for a large uh, ciphertext would be uh, would be expensive, but there are still interesting operations um, that we can do. For example, in the paper, we proposed the several ways that to allow users to decrypt the ciphertext uh, partially. And for example, by leveraging the you know the record structure in TLS, we can do record level and the block level um, selective opening pretty efficiently. Well, another example uh, of what provers may do is to combine the selective opening with other bells and whistles, such as to prove a statement about part of the plain text, which usually is a lot shorter than the full plain text, which hopefully will give you uh, more efficient zero knowledge proofs, such as the age is uh, such as her age is over 18 or her balance is greater than a threshold. We implemented the, actually both of these examples uh, in the paper. The cost to generate these, uh, these proofs is application specific. It depends totally on what statement you want to prove and how complex that is. I will give you an example uh, here and uh, we have uh, more data in the, in the paper. In the age proof application we implemented, the prover, the prover proves that her age is over 18 according to the data from a university registrar website. Okay, the, the, the proof involves um, parsing, download, getting the ciphertext, the open part of it, and parsing some of the string and do a range proof. So all of this can be done in about four seconds using uh, LibSnark. Right? Again, although this is not blazingly fast, but for Periodical and infrequent uh, age verification applications, we, we think this is suitable and perfectly fine, especially given the cryptographic guarantees we get from the, this type of proofs. And to summarize here, um, DECO essentially allows users to export their private data to, uh, with integrity guarantee to others without server's help. And you heard about uh, blockchain applications from ARI. There are also non-blockchain applications, such as age proof, and you can also think of others, such as proof of ownership of online accounts, proof of uh, integrity of um, personal data to enable marketplace of that, etc. So 
that, that concludes my uh, part of the talk. Um, DECO, in summary, DECO is a privacy-preserving Oracle protocol Oracle protocols that allows you to prove statement about the, your um, TLS connection with, uh, with a server. I, it works with more than TLS versions, requiring no trusted hardware, and requires no server-side modification. I highly recommend you go to visiting our website, deco.works. We do have a blog post there uh, with more information, and our paper is also posted online. And uh, with that, I will conclude the talk. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you. We do have time for some questions. We'll start here with Nigel. Um, yeah, you did this two PC um, PRF evaluation. Um, what did you use for that? Was it passive, active, secure? What yeah, technology? We use, um, yeah, we use a malicious secure uh, garbled circuit based uh, uh, two PC from uh, CCS 17. So it seems as though the query is just directly encrypted by the, uh, by the client. How do you avoid issues where the response, say, like take the age verification example, what if the registrar's page doesn't include the student's name? That's a great question. Um, for simplicity here, I assume the, the response uh, has the information for the query, but actually you can do similar things for the query. You can generate the query in 2PC. We discussed this in the, in the paper. So this might be very closely related to what you just said about proving the content of the query. It seems like given the focus on unmodified servers, currently the servers don't really expect that the strings that they send back will be presented to a third party like out of context. So it seems like that might be a strict requirement that the verifier that the verifier understands the context of what strings may be sent by the server. That's a very good question. Um, we actually discussed this property which we call uh, contextual integrity to prove not only that the, this is a substring in the plain text, but the substring appeared in the expected location. Um, yeah, f um, for, for many, uh, for, for the popular, op uh, for popular data formats such as HTML and JSON, actually there's a way to do it, uh, uh, do it rigorously by parsing part of the data. And, uh, but yeah, that's a great question. We do have a discussion in the paper and uh, for the, yeah, you, I'm more than happy to discuss it offline. Thanks. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, could you quickly go to the slide where you do the key exchange? That right here. Um, here. Oh no, sorry, the previous one. Thank you. Um, is there any chance that uh, so how much trust is put on the verifier? I'm wondering if they could choose like a value of x v that is weak somehow, like. I don't know, the group order divided by two or some arithmetic that I cannot come up with on the spot and use it to recover the shared secret even though they're not supposed to. Uh, we, it certainly, uh, here the note that the verifier chose this value like independently without seeing the prover's value. So one attack we considered is uh, can the prover, um, for example, by seeing the verifier's choice um, to choose a key that is uh, uh, that, is, that, is, that is somehow correlated to the verifier's uh, choice. Um, so we, the, the thing is, uh, at the end, if the server, if the prover chose the key dishonestly, uh, later, in the later stage of the protocol, the 2PC, um, the zero-knowledge proof part will, will break. The prover wouldn't be able to generate uh, a, a sound proof. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's... But uh, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if the verifier is dishonest to try to either not recover ciphertext, uh, sorry, plain text. Right, so both prover and verifier can be actively malicious. Right. And, uh, right. and the verifier, if verifier chooses a weak key, it is only to the disadvantage of the verifier. Okay. Because that would allow the prover to somehow maybe circum circumvent the integrity. Right, okay. I mean, the, the two provers together are acting as a joint client. Mm -hmm. That's the important point here. Otherwise, it just looks like ordinary Yeah, yeah, TLS. I was just wondering how much they trust each other. They, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
have a question about uh, the fact that the prover doesn't have the, uh, verif the verifying MAC key. Then you have um, a counter mode encryption, and uh, the beginning of the transaction between the prover and the server, um, and a malicious adversary in the middle between them can modify whatever the server sends. And this might enable him to attack the prover even before we start uh, this, this part of the protocol. Yeah, that's a great point. Here, um, I, I think I made a, a slight simplification by assuming there's only one response from the server. And if the prover and the server talks back and forth, this is, um, uh, I would say, a less um, like common scenario for DECO to be used. But in that case, yeah, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the session, you, this prover do need to run some additional 2PC to verify MAC tags before proceed. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. If uh, you use it uh, as an oracle in smart contracts, did try to estimate gas costs, in particular compared to, I don't know, wrapping into everything into a snark, or you wrap everything into a snark right here? Right? Uh, the, I think the envision to use is to prove uh, the facts to the, to the oracle, and oracle will issue a, a message. It will, will, for example, sign on the fact and send it to the, to the smart contract. So, from a smart contract point of view, there will not be a ah, so smart contract doesn't see snark involved. Of chain. Right, so we, we proved uh, facts to the Oracle and uh, yeah. A smart contract can't participate in, uh, in MPC because it has no secret state. Or maybe emulate, okay, thank you. Is it quick? Yeah, it's quick. In the MPC, you break it into two parts, You're using malicious security, but what prevents the uh, parties from importing incorrect input into the second part? Uh, we, at, um, I think the simple answer to that is, um, so there are two ways to deal with it. One is, actually the protocol as is, uh, is, uh, is still secure because this will be caught later on in the stage. Although the MPC will perhaps output the junk and uh, it won't be detected, but later on in the proof stage, the proof will fail because Ooh, the prover so don't take have care of it later on. Okay, it's ta taken care of, but there's also a, like a slight uh, tweak to get rid of this completely um, by having the two parties to commit their, to their uh, key share and prove knowledge about it. Um, yeah, but, but the, even the protocol as is uh, without the additional tweak is already uh, deal, deals with that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you uh, everybody for the great questions for that talk. Thank you to the speakers um, and it's now time for coffee.